Welcome to the Nathan Crane Podcast, your number one source for everything holistic health. Listen to guest interviews with top doctors and health experts and discover cutting edge solutions for living your healthiest, longest, and most fulfilling life. There's never been a better time to become healthier, happier, and more alive. And now your host, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and cancer health researcher and educator, Nathan Crane. Dr. Isaac Elias, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Nathan. I'm, I love talking to you, and here is another opportunity, so thank you. So you are teaching something um, at our upcoming retreat in Arizona at our Holistic Leadership Council that you call Open Heart Meditation, which I think is a really catchy name. I'm really looking forward to experiencing it. Um, what I'm really curious about is how you discovered meditation and not only discovered it, but have been practicing it for decades and teaching it um, for a long time as well as a conventionally trained medical doctor. So anyone who has gone down, you know, con conventionally trained medical school, for example, who, whether an oncologist or you become an MD in any discipline, uh, rarely experiences meditation or even considers meditation as a form of health and healing uh, as an effective evidence-based form of of healing and yet you not only practice and teach it but you embody it and and swear by it as as an essential component to living a healthy disease-free life so what got you into meditation and, and and talk a little bit about that as a you know conventionally trained medical doctor discover meditation tell us yeah. that story <laughs> I'm kind of laughing because I got into meditation so many years before I even started medical school. It was so, you know, it's a really interesting point. Many people discover meditation, discover a spiritual path out of a crisis. It's very common. You know, I'm highly trained in Tibetan Buddhism. And, and so I studied with some of the greatest teachers in the, since the late 80s. And we would have these very secluded retreats of very advanced students and we would kind of talk to each other and everybody came because of some trauma and God, I didn't have any trauma, you know, I didn't know what to do. I felt strange, but uh, of course I have trauma as I'll talk, but not in the context of my God, I need something now. It's certain earning I had in me since I was like 11, 12 years old. So I remember I would go and buy anthroposophical books and yoga books and read on my own. I didn't share with my parents. I was I was the oldest uh, child, sibling of five, and my mother was a judge. My father was an engineer. So, you know, well-educated, regular people, secular, not Jewish, religious in Israel. But I had this drive, and I would read it, and I would like, I would just go there and kind of teach myself. And the big shift came when I my father was a civil engineer, and we spent a year and a half in Korea when I was 15, so 10th grade, I was in an American school and there I got introduced to Taekwondo. But I got introduced to an unusual branch of Taekwondo, an alternative, more philosophical branch, like the head of the, of the lineage was a philosophy professor in university. And, uh, and there was a big emphasis on forms and on meditation, not so much on, on fighting. And also had the opportunity to practice with the Korean national team, which at that time were all the world champions because they needed to learn English and this was an English speaking. So I got very lucky and I learned yoga and I started meditating. So this was like 15 years old. And I pretty much kept it since then. So I, when I went to medical school, I was already a yoga teacher. It was after the army that is compulsory in Israel. And I was a yoga teacher. So I knew I'm going to medical school. I knew that the philosophy is not my philosophy. I knew I have to survive it. And afterwards, I'm going to do something very different, holistic, which honestly, I really didn't know exactly what it was. I just knew I'm not going to do regular medicine. So I went through this route of going through the six years of training in medical school while becoming a yoga teacher, being a teacher in yoga teachers' training courses, learning shiatsu, learning Chinese medicine, 
And at that time, I specialized in back problems with therapeutic yoga, which was interesting. It was really the beginning of going into my own body. And uh, I'm kind of going a little bit off topic because, you know, I love talking to, but it was interesting. I was working with one of the best scoliosis surgeons in, in Israel because I was interested in scoliosis. I learned a special shiatsu technique with exercises where we, will, we would reverse scoliosis. And I noticed that he gives the same exercises to everybody. And for some people, it's such, it's a wrong exercise. You know, if you have low doses, you don't want to bend backward. You're going to make your, your low doses bigger. So I used to, when people used to come with back problems, I would just sort of kind of get into a, this open space and I would get into the problem and I would see how I'm unwinding it. And this is the exercise I would give them. So I developed this whole specialty and I learned a Chinese medicine acupuncture for three years while in medical school. So when I started my internship after finishing medical school in Israel, you first do internship. In the United States, it's part of residency, and then you do your residency. So I remember I was in a one week, actually it was a 10 days Qigong Chinese medicine retreat in the desert <laughs> with, 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 my, with, with my precious wife who was in eight months of pregnancy. And then the, I came from the retreat, like on, I think on a Saturday and on Sunday, I started internship and the first rotation was surgery. Wow. And you, can you just imagine, imagine the, here I am like in another realm and I hear the surgeons, you know, they're eating their donuts, drinking their coffee and the first thing they were talking, they were saying, wow, if we just didn't have any patients, medicine would be so good, you know? So it was such a difference. I was in two different worlds, but I had this very deep sense that I have to integrate them. So I, 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 I continued my journey through meditation, yogic meditation. I did some Sikh meditation for years. And when I came- so I was, Sikh, just clarify, Sikh, Sikh like S-I-K-H. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sikh, different like visualization. The, like the religion. And, yeah. yeah. And, some, and then when I came to United States to, after I finished my internship, I already had a big center in Israel for integrative medicine and teaching a lot. I left everything behind and decided it's time to be a student. We came to United States in 1989 so I can get a master of science in, in, in Chinese medicine. And, and Gilly, my, my partner, continued to, to study with our daughter. And we right when we came, we actually met, uh, got introduced to Tibetan Buddhism, met our teacher. And that's really what kept us here because I got very involved in meditation practice. And so I carried a very intense meditation practice. I probably would never have repeated it uh, where I would do two to three hours a day. And then starting pretty early on, I would go away to the mountains for 20 years for two to three months a year. And uh, for 10 years, I did half a day of retreat, early morning to noon, and then I would go to work. One day a week, I would go to the clinic a little bit earlier. And one day a week, I, I wouldn't work. And we have a five acre that we live in nature. I would start in the evening, sleep in the forest, no water, no electricity, and, and just be in the forest with some hot water and some water and an outhouse, and then wake up and do the whole day retreat and come home in the evening before the next day. So I had this one day like being totally inside a redwood forest for years and years. And within it, I was fortunate because I got to be the doctor and a one-on-one -on -one student of some of the greatest meditation masters in the Himalaya, the most mm -hmm. legendary ones. So I got very unique teachings and very esoteric teaching. And I actually left for like two, three years, everything to meditate. And then I realized that it all boils down to opening our heart. There's the expression of enlightened mind the expression of, of spiritual path is unconditional, innate, boundless love that we all have a capacity to touch and we all touch in certain level for certain times. There are moments when the heart is open, for me at least, and moments when the heart closes, you know, due, due to life, because none of us is perfect. So I, I, when I was on retreat, I had a certain inside vision a certain knowledge about healing that comes from very, very sacred meditation practices. 
And I, so for years, I practiced it by myself. I usually don't share it in podcasts. So it was in a special day of the year while I was isolated in the mountains in January 2009. And it was a whole healing system that is based on meditation on how to use effortlessness with intention and, and, and create healing. So I didn't share it with anyone. I practiced it for five years. And I and I and I just treated in this way, and it was profound. And then I, I decided I realized, wow, I really have to start sharing it. And some of my teachers in the Himalayas told me in advance that I will be sharing such knowledge before I got it. So uh, then it became so evident to me that it's really the ultimate medicine is our open heart, love and compassion. So I call it open heart medicine, and it was going to be the topic of my first book in Hebrew because I taught a lot in Israel, but then the COVID came. I finished writing it. The COVID came, so I put it aside, and then came out with a survival paradox, which is a more of a medical uh, life experience, similar concept, because when we are in a survival mode, our heart cannot be opened. You know, we are, we are, we are contracting. We are, we are self-focused. So this is really my, my, my journey. And I'm actually looking forward hopefully in a year or two or three to a place of where I go back into doing long time, long-term retreats and many hours of retreats and within it sharing and teaching. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was fortunate, you know, uh, to really, to really meet some remarkable teachers. And uh, I know I'm, I'm still consider myself a beginner, but I'm on a, on a, on a highway that is specifically geared towards healing. So really my specialty, I would not teach meditation if it wasn't really in the context of healing. And you know, Nathan, sometimes I'm in my early 60s and I will meditate even for a few minutes and I will get these unique insights. And I ask myself, wow, Isaac, why did it take 50 years for you to really experience this. And you know, there are no shortcuts. It's an unfolding process. And the moment we think you got it, I have it, I'm special, you get stuck, it's like turning water into ice. Everything stops. It's a continuous flow, continuous involvement, and continuous opening. And, uh, you know, life is bumps, they slow you down, and then it is support, it speeds you up. We are all on such journeys. So that's a little bit about how, how so obviously it's really it's really who I am. So when a patient comes into the clinic because I'm trained to meditate with open eyes. So when I talk to you, I'm meditating right now. So when I'm with the patient, I meditate. So it becomes a 24-7 process. And then medicine is an expression of my meditation. Somebody else. Art is the expression of the meditation. A great meditation master, their mind knowledge is the expression of their meditation and realization. So for me, it's healing. And uh, I've made a commitment to share it, despite the fact that many of my teachers felt that the certain knowledge I have is not something that is as easily teachable. Some say you cannot teach it. But as a, <laughs> as a Jewish Israeli, I, I don't like to agree. Right. So I, I'm, I'm trying to create very creative ways of sharing and teaching so people don't have to go through the torturous route that I took, you know, of just figuring in it and sitting for tens of thousands of hours. Actually. Yeah, yeah, incredible. I, I mean, I'm agreeing with you saying, right, in the, in, and I completely relate with, having you know multiple spiritual masters and teachers in my life for the past 17 years and some of them you know i would say over complicating um philosophies to kind of come you, you know the 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 some of the buddhist ways of teaching are you know to like really confuse you to help in in the deeper understanding of it that i get from it is to help you think for yourself to to figure out the teaching, right? To figure out the underlying essence or wisdom that's being shared. But I like to, you know, uh, take really complex, complicated things like I do with, with research, for example, for cancer and make it super simple and practical and applicable for as many people as possible. I like to take, I like to understand really complex ideas 
and complex science and complex spiritual philosophies and then you know boil it down into a b c d e it's just kind of how my brain works and i don't know if that works for everybody but uh, that's how i like to look at things um you know it's a process for you so you see it's you can't get to the simple explanation without going to the complexity of understanding so this is a process of unlearning it's a very important process you're fortunate you're doing it early in your life you know it uh it's it's a very important process. You learn the information and then you unlearn. And when you unlearn, it distills itself in a much simpler way. I've had some really great, you know, spiritual mentors early on in my life. The first one at about 17, 18 years old, mm -hmm. and then the second one from about uh, 20 to 23, and then, you know, multiple over the years. And so, so that certainly helps, having a mentor in your life. Um, but I wanted to... Take a, we'll ask you a few things. The first is, you know, you're, you're, you are a renowned doctor in the integrative health space and the holistic health space. I mean, you speak at conferences, you get grants from the NIH to do research projects. You are an accomplished uh, scientific uh, published author. Um, you know, you have a, a thriving cl clinic, you are just a highly respected medical doctor coming from a very holistic and integrative approach, uh, getting great results for patients and teaching other doctors. And so, you know, coming from this very accomplished place that you are, how much would you say having a meditation practice, I don't know if it's, you know, I would say a daily meditation practice, right? How much has that been? How much do you feel that has been essential to your success and coupled with success, your own internal happiness and fulfillment? It's, it's essential. It's not, it's like, it's like breathing for me. So I'm at a place in my life well, because of the decades of training, I can get by with less meditation. But earlier on, when I was less trained and meditation was less developed, I remember I would go, I would go into the forest, and then our neighbors up really nice. They, they didn't have a fence, and then when they had a fence, they made a, a gate for me. And they have this amazing meadow where I look east, see the sunrise, and then all around is redwood. And I would just sit and I would unwind. Just mm. every feeling, every thought, just letting it come. And, <laughs> you know, I would just sit there for a few hours. There were periods I would sit, that my retreats were outside, actually. And then I would <laughs> I would emerge out of the forest up to our house. And interesting, the forest is in a redwood, so it's much cooler. And as I would be with the coat, even in the summertime, and I would, like, emerge out of the forest, and I would be a different person than I was when I walked in at 5.30 or 6 a.m. and uh, ready for the day. And I started noticing the difference in my quality of healing based on the quality of my meditation. As I integrated it more into my life, then it became the effect, you know, it just, and definitely when I'm more stressed, when I have less time to meditate, it affects my healing. There's no doubt about it. And <clears throat> the remarkable thing is that when you connect with this infinite healing potential of love and compassion, of the universal heart, that this heart is just connected to, is just a representative of, is our inner connectivity. It's not like, oh my God, I got a special heart. Better. No, we all have it. Because as hearts of everybody listening gets dirty blood, connects with the universe, and gives without judgment. That's how the heart works. Otherwise, we won't be alive. So it's built within us. This is really the divine in within us. You know, people who are into Judeo-Christian, Islamic uh, religions, you know, in the Bible, it says we were made in the in the image of God. So the image of God is divine qualities in every cell in our body. And the heart represents in so many traditions the, con the coming home. So when we connect to it, we become a different person different people, different person. You know, I go and I teach retreats to 150 people in Israel and there are, you know, maybe half are cancer patients and and it's just every day that goes by and it starts at 6 until 10 p.m. And I teach almost all the time. 
And whenever day goes by, I just have more energy and I'm more vibrant and I'm more radiant. And, 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 you know, I remember my, my mother was asking me, how come, how do you do this? Why don't, doesn't it get you exhausted? Isn't it too difficult? No, because you connect with this amazing stream that just changes our consciousness. And I think now there's a lot of interest in psychedelics and expanding our consciousness. It's really trying to touch these places. And sometimes the experience is so vast and we are trained not to hold to experiences for decades. It's unique to, to the training I do. It's the experience of openness, of happiness is so vast that it's literally hard to contain. You can't put it in words. And in this space where we can, without effort, channel it into healing, that's when the magic happens. Mm. 100%. And, you know, I, I discovered, you know, meditation um, and this deeper spiritual understanding early on from a much more esoteric uh, philosophical approach, right? This connection to the divine, this uh, connection to a higher source, a higher power, God, whatever we want to call it. From just from feeling and connecting and sitting with you know Buddhist master teachers and Zen monks and chanting with Hari Krishnas and so sitting in meditation and listening for hours and hours at a time. Just like you were talking about, I used to meditate hours and hours a day. Sometimes I go to the beach and go into a meditation and come out three or four hours later and then write down pages and pages and pages of like downloads that I got during that right. time. It's so powerful, right? We connect Very to cool. this. You know, one of my spiritual mentors called it the hard drive of the universe where we totally. can connect to every single thought that ever existed before. And so, you know, there's a very esoteric point of view. And what I've done in the last decade plus have started to understand the biological mechanisms and the science behind why this works and what it does to our physiology, what it does to our biology, I should say. And, and what's always fascinating is how our ancient ancestors, these master teachers have known this for thousands of years. This knowledge has been passed down both in ancient India and ancient China, right? Uh, for thousands of years has been documented. They knew what was happening with all these practices through breath work, through meditation, through yoga, etc. And now our science is just starting to Picking understand up. what it's doing to our biology. So, you know, in the, activating the parasympathetic nervous system, you know, upregulating the immune system, turning up B cells and NK natural right. killer cells and T cells and fighting cancer and all these kinds of things. So talk a little bit about that uh, for people who don't know. What is the, what's happening biologically when you are practicing uh, meditation? So of course, there's a lot of research on it and a lot of understandings and, and quantum mechanics cell sheds a lot of light into it. But when we look at our physiology, and that's really the value of the of, of my book, The Survival Paradox, is that we are all wired to survive. Every cell in our body is wired and built to survive. It's what keeps us alive. And that's really the survival paradox. Because we are wired to survive initially in our the embryo, as an embryo, the survival expresses itself with proper embryogenesis, developing organs that are normal. <clears throat> but once we are out in the world, we start facing challenges and injuries. And part of our survival is to repair these injuries. So because we are built to survive innately, and as you mentioned already, our immediate response to survival is automated through the autonomic nervous system, through the sympathetic nervous system. And so the moment, it's a fraction of the second, we all experience it, right? We either go into a fighting mode which drives the inflammatory process. So I'll, I'll start big and then I'll go into the cell. Or we go into hiding. We run away. We isolate ourselves. We run away. Outside, we can run away. Inside, how do we run away? Free. By, by shielding ourselves. By creating a coating, a lattice formation. It creates a micro environment, a separate environment. 
And when cells in the body loses communication with each other because a certain cell, for a certain reason, either it has a toxic pesticide or it has a toxic heavy metals, or the cell got nourished at the time of trauma and absorbed the energy of the trauma, the cell goes into survival mode. What is survival, Nathan? Survival is not accepting that everything that expresses itself will come to an end. That's the definition of survival. So the cell wants to survive. It creates a microenvironment. It starts nourishing itself in a different way than the body. It starts not listening to the body anymore because the body is telling him the cell it's time to go into apoptosis. And, and what happened to the cell? It's called a cancer cell. That's really the definition of cancer. In my book, The Survival Paradox, I really treat cells as living beings with a personality, with a psychology. They really are, you know, for it's often, and I'm sure you've seen it, cancer patients where they have some lymph node or metastasis on the skin. You can see the cancer one day angry, more hard, more red, and one day more relaxed, more subdued. So this happens on the tumor level, it happens on the cellular level. So we have about rounding upward a little bit, about 50 trillion cells, okay? Not million, million times a thousand is a billion, times a thousand is a trillion times 50. And each cell has close to one million reactions a second. So imagine 50 trillion cells, almost infinite number, one million reactions in a second, and we are still one person. It's truly a miracle. And then, that and we then, can then, add, and then add to that, in each cell, right? One million reactions per second, right. 50 trillion cells. And then in each cell, we have hundreds to thousands of what are now being considered microorganisms. We call them mitochondria, which also okay. have their own separate DNA and functions that keep the exactly. cell alive, right? And they're, they're a big part of those 1 million functions and processes that are happening every second. I was just going to get to you. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's just true. incredible. It's mind-blowing. I, <laughs> I was just going to actually get into, into the mitochondria. So the cell, in one level, is our most smallest identified self. It has a, it has a boundary, a membrane, just like we have a skin. It decides what comes in, what goes out. If the cell feels safe, if the cell feels quote unquote loved, if it feels what is love, that the environment around it wants to take care of it, then we relax, we go into a parasympathetic mode. Now, I am describing right now an autonomic nervous system effect, but there is a biochemical effect that is driven by alarming survival proteins and the key one that I've researched for close to 30 years and made a lot of the discoveries about how to block it and what happens when you block it is called galactin-3. And I'll get to it a little bit later. It's fun when we have a lot of time to talk, so I don't have to rush. So now the cell feels safe. It's relaxed. It produces energy very efficiently. Meaning from one molecule of glucose, it can produce... 36 molecules of ATP. Right. But if we go into a danger zone, into a survival mode, which is what cancer cell does and other conditions, we need to, to produce energy fast. So we skip the mitochondria, which I'll get to in a moment, and we produce energy through anaerobic glycolysis. Yep. Now we can produce 100 times more energy very fast but five to 6% efficiency. Two ATPs compared to 18. Now, a cancer cell is in panic. A cancer cell <clears throat> doesn't recognize that it actually has oxygen, that you can actually use the mitochondria and oxidative phosphorylation. And so it produces through glycolysis in the presence of oxygen. And this is a Warburg effect. So one thing that is worthwhile for people cancer patient or doctors is to really ask the, the patient, what made your cancer, what made you not be able to take a deep breath? And you will get amazing stories. Like when I do like cranial sacral, I just focus and I, and I feel the tumor and I ask the, the patient the question, 
And it's very important not to tell the patient what you see. Okay, that's a tip for healers. We want to feel, oh, we are amazing. Oh, I can feel. No, no. You are taking the discovery away from the patient. You just guide them because if the patient makes the discovery, they are opening a door to releasing the trauma, to what is called memory reconsolidation. They are building a new, a fresh experience. It is enormous healing power, enormous healing power. So our job as healers is just to hold them, you know, and let them, let them get there. So <clears throat> when we're in safety, the cell knows that it can produce energy. Well, there's a molecule called AMPK, adenosine monophosphate kinase, gets upregulated. Also happens when we don't eat too much sugar, when we exercise, where insulin receptors are working well. And then something called mTOR1 system is down-regulated, and something called hypoxia-inducing factor is shut down. The cell doesn't feel like it doesn't have oxygen. There's actually a factor in the cell that sets an alarm when it feels I don't have oxygen. Now, if we feel like we don't have oxygen, we activate an enzyme called PDK, and uh, pyrovendidrogenase kinase, which shuts down the main enzyme PDH, which allows the, the metabolite of glucose pyruvate to get into the, into the mitochondria, again, hundreds of thousands of mitochondria, and produce energy properly. So when we go on ketogenic diet, when we go on intermittent fasting, when we don't eat too much glucose, and we find sugar when we exercise, when we meditate, we are shifting the cell into a normal metabolism. And kind of to close the circle, <clears throat> when we meditate, it can take longer because we are asking for a mind effect to percolate down all the way to the cell compared to changing a diet where you just feed the cell with something else. But when we use meditation, we are getting to the substance, to the biochemistry through our essence, through our energy expression, and then through the substance. So we are, we are working on all the levels of our being. And that's why the healing is so profound. And I know it from my own experience, how I would come out of the six to eight to 10 weeks retreat, I would look 15 years younger, I would feel 15 years younger. <clears throat> Health problems I had just would, dissipate away and then as i get got back into life they slowly started you know creeping back and then there would be another retreat so i'm really waiting to go back <laughs> <laughs> hey i just want to take a quick second and thank you for listening to this episode i hope you're enjoying it so far as a special thank you for tuning into this episode i want to give you my number one Amazon best-selling book, absolutely free. You can go download it right now at becomingcancerfree.com. If you want to learn evidence-based strategies for helping your body become a cancer-fighting machine for not only cancer reversal, but cancer prevention, go grab a copy of the book. Again, I'm just giving it to you for free. You can go download it at becomingcancerfree.com. All right, let's get back to the show. So obviously, by what you just described, you are in agreement with the, uh, you know, what Professor Seafried has published based on Otto Warburg's work that you already mentioned about the, you know, cancer as a metabolic, primarily mitochondrial disease. Right? Cancer is a metabolic disease. Yeah, it's Definitely. not a genetic disease as we've been, you know, led to believe. Genetics meaning... will affect metabolism. Epigenetics yep. will affect the always. You know, I'm kind of a little bit laughing because I would send every cancer patient in the 90s to do chemo, sen chemo sensitivity. This was before genomic. Dr. 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 Weisenthal and, 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 and Dr. Nagurney were the two leading ones at that time. And oncologists would laugh at you. And now it's becoming standard, but they are making an error. Not that it doesn't help patients, but they are looking at genomic testing and it's very, it's very narrow. They're looking, basically, for patients don't know this, they go and they get this genomic testing, which are pretty much focused on filling up clinical trials and trying new drugs, you know? They're not really wide and open for things they used to test 10 years ago. But we have to understand the genomic, but we have to understand 
the body has a choice if it's going to activate a gene. Now with cancer, it's trickier. Why is it trickier with cancer? We go back to the isolation. The cancer creates its microenvironment. So the cancer doesn't listen as quickly to what the body says. That's why if you have certain illnesses, a pain in the body, arthritis, inflammation, hypertension, you meditate, it will get better much quicker than cancer because you have you have to meditate deep enough to get into a place that the body lost control over. And if you ask me at some point how you do this, it's a great, great uh, topic that I love talking about. <laughs> it's complicated, yeah. Yeah, let's, okay, so let, let's, yes, how do you do that? But first, so people understand what's happening, why meditation is so effective. Um, how I understand it from a biological standpoint is you are, uh, you know, we can get into the energetic, we can get into the spiritual side of it, but right. from a very simple biological standpoint, you are basically, you're upregulating the immune system, right? Yes. And, the, to, and the metabolic system, very important. Right, which, which is essential for eliminating cancer cells. Our body is designed to find target and destroy and and remove and recycle cancer cells. Right. And our immune system does that. And our lymphatic system is a big part of that as well, right? And the and the the um cells from um, the immune cells from our bone marrow, all of this is activated when we uh enter into a meditative state. It's also activated when we do things like exercise, when we do things like healthy stressors, hormesis, right? Sauna, yeah. ice baths. Um, it's also activated when we're, we get into deep sleep and we enter autophagy or autophagy, right. depending on how, how you want to pronounce that. Uh, but autophagy or autophagy, basically our body is designed to clean up these cells even before and they come cancerous. But like you said, it's in modern society, so many people are so stressed all the time that they never give a chance or they give very few chances for their immune system to do its job, which is totally. get rid of these cancer cells. Completely. So this is key, key, key. We have the capacity to actually kill cancer cells, to protect ourselves. And it's interesting, you know, immunotherapy is at the forefront right now of, of oncological care. And for example, PDL1 inhibitors, you know, have done some help, maybe not as much as we would like, but they definitely make a difference. But you find out that patients who have high level of galactin-3, this alarming survival protein, do not respond to PDL1 inhibitors. So what happens is that when we have, and that's why the metabolism, the extracellular space, the connectivity between the cells is key. And uh, because when a cell is in a survival mode, it is part of the survival mode, it, it overexpresses galactin-3, which shuts down the immune response while creating inflammation, immune dysregulation. It's very fascinating with COVID. The spike protein is almost identical in structure to galactin-3 because it's a survival protein of the virus. You know, our gut, our biofilm, when we are under stress, when the gut feels that we are in danger, it activates the biofilm and you no know, lime lime spiral kits get activated. Everybody wants to survive. The microbiome wants to survive. We want to survive. If we are in harmony with our microbiome, if we are in harmony between ourselves, the body will feel in harmony. And a great study for this which we just submitted the manuscript and we presented in Europe and I'm presenting in ASCO GU in San Francisco in February. We did our multi-center trial on biochemical relapse of prostate cancer using modified citrus pectin. So modified citrus pectin is the blocker of galactin-3, this survival paradox protein that drives cancer growth and metastasis. So why is this very symbolic? Because patients have prostate cancer the prostate is removed either through radiation or through surgery or both. And there is no PSA because there's no more prostate left. And then the cancer starts to regrow back and PSA shows up because of the cancer. Now, the cancer is very small. 
it's usually a little bit more aggressive than the initial cancer, but the body has a chance to take care of it, and it doesn't. So once the PSA for these people, where the cancer starts coming back, 80% of them, it will become active and grow, and, and, and grow, and the speed of growth goes up. It's called PSA velocity, PSA doubling time. When we gave them MCP 15 grams a day, compared to their baseline, which we expected it will at least stay the same or get faster. After 18 months, that's our long-term multi-center 60 patients. After 18 months, 990 of the patient had either a slowing down of the growth, complete stop of the growth, or the PSA even went down. Wow. Now the MCP, the modified retrospectin, did not kill the cancer directly. It dissolved the, the lattice formation made by galactin-3. It dissolved the microenvironment. It regulated the immune response. And it allowed the body to do its job. So for me, that's a great example, really a gift from nature of everything we talked about. Because what it did, we reconnected with our innate healing ability. So one level is the simple supplement, but what we are interested, you and I, you know, it's part of our connection, we're interested to have people understand it's multifaceted, it's multidimensional, it's amazing, it unfolds, it changes your life experience. And so that's the real healing, the real healing. I, I call physical healing, even of chronic disease, acute medicine. The real medicine, the ultimate healing is connecting with our healing potential because that's where we transform. That's the transformative power of, of this body, of our life. And so it's a journey between dealing with the survival, which Chinese medicine will call maintenance. I'm also a Chinese doctor. And using the evolutionary power of the body, the transformative power of the body, the, the going back home power of the body, which is a deeper healing. Okay, so that was so that's a new study that is being published soon. Yeah, yeah, the, we already presented it in okay. uh, in EUMC, European uh, Society of Urological uh, Cancer, in November, and we got accepted to to uh, yeah, GU to 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 ask a GU. It will be presented in February. I'm 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 presenting it. And what's and, the title? Uh, what's the title of the study? I think the the effect of uh, of uh, modified citrospectin on uh, on biochemical relapse of of prostate cancer. Okay, so people can can search it after it's been published yeah, yeah. if they want to look at it. Now right. there are a lot of studies on modified citrospectin. Of course, yeah. Right, and and like you said, this has been, you know, studying galactin three has been something you've been doing for three plus decades, and. Yeah. I first learned about this through you and was completely fascinated by it. And let's take a, let's unpack that a little bit. So for people who don't know what Galactin 3 is, you know, you just talked about it. You kind of went really fast over it. So, so yeah, let's, right. let's um, just break it down really simply for people. What is Galactin 3? Uh, <clears throat> what's its function and why is it, why is it effective to actually slow it down or block it? You don't completely stop it with modified citrus pectin, right? It, it can slow it down. It can block it. And so why is that important? So let's just break that down real quick for people. So galactin-3 is a, is a carbohydrate binding protein, a, galac a, a, a galacturonic acid binding protein. That we, our body produces. Yes. To, exactly. to create inflammation as a healing uh, exactly. process. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's a protein that binds to different carbohydrate on, carb on small, on like what we call oligosaccharide, on glycoprotein, on glycolipids, which are often present in oxidized lipids, etc. <clears throat> so this protein is our, I coined it a survival paradox protein. The body uses it within within minutes of being under danger, emotional danger, trauma, infection, sepsis, very big. And then galactin-3 is like the bus. Like the what? It, like the bus, like the train. It, oh, hears uh -huh. a, it hears that there is a problem in the body. It gets expressed. It binds to different ligands. 
if there's a immune immune uh, immune disruptors if it's a uh, hyper viscosity if it's a uh, if it's scarring uh, co-compounds if it's compounds that affect narrow inflammation and it drives them to the area of injury as part of trying to produce inflammation and later fibrosis as a repair mechanism as an right. as an often unsuccessful damaging repair mechanism which relates to Of course, in a deeper way, to what happened with trauma. You know, when we have a trauma, at the time of trauma, the response of the body was the best response the body has done. But right now, years or days or months or a multi-generation later, it's not the best response for us. Well, and so let's talk about what that response is because it's really fascinating, right? Um, and this has been discovered recently in the past few decades, I believe, that when you have a trauma, Like as a child, for example, and you don't really know how to process it emotionally. It can happen as an adult as well, any kind of trauma. Right, right. Your, your, your body actually produces neuropeptides, right. and those neuropeptides can get stuck in, in, in different parts of your body, in different organs, in different areas, and you, do, you don't know how to – it's your body. It's a survival mechanism. It's protecting you because if you didn't, you might just – literally explode right What mentally yeah. emotionally you might melt down you might right. have because you don't know how to process that trauma so we exactly. as you said we create this kind of you know shield around us well totally. biologically and neurochemically we produce neuropeptides and these kind of help store that trauma for us until we can process them out later through meditation and healing practices and yoga and breath mm-hmm. work and this is why you get into this kind of work in your life and And you know you might just start you, you might be doing a, a meditation practice or breath work or something and just start bawling you know crying like crazy just you know freaking out screaming letting loose which sounds scary for some people but it's actually unbelievably healing and when you're done it's like you just released some form of trauma that you were holding on to and release those neuropeptides as well which were causing inflammation chronic right. inflammation totally right so often often these compounds are are bound to galactin-3 ah, as part of the lattice. So the reason why, and so some, especially some, some, some compounds that specifically create narrow inflammation are driven by galactin-3. So galactin-3, talking about the same topic, disrupts the blood-brain barrier and allows molecules that are not supposed to get into the brain to get into the brain. It creates glial activation. But interesting, a paper just recently published in 2022, show that when you create hypoxia in nerve cells when you stop blood supply galactin 3 comes to the area that didn't get enough oxygen and creates inflammation and fibrosis and when you block it with and when you give modified citrospectin you reverse the damage so interesting when we go back galactin 3 is the bus that takes to different areas in the body within minutes <clears throat> different inflammatory compounds The problem different than the sympathetic system that if we are stressed and we meditate for a few minutes, take some deep breath, our power sympathetic system kicks in. Our biochemical response is not easy to change. <clears throat> and you can see why because now we brought other compounds and cytokine and there is suddenly you got interleukin 6 and you got TNF alpha and you got you know interleukin 10 and Here you are, everything is on fire. And so I've actually shown, I've done very important research that was published, and that's the topic of my NIH grants, that <clears throat> when I block, when we blocked galactin-3 while producing sepsis in animals, we dramatically reduced the mortality of the animals from the sepsis and the kidney damage. And more than this, we showed that The patient coming into the ICU with sepsis without pre-existing condition means they don't have a kidney disease, heart disease or cancer and they come with sepsis and when you check their blood there is no de- apparent damage to the kidneys. Their level of galactin 3 at time of admission within six hours will determine who later on will get kidney damage which often drives chronic damage and death. And who is going to die in the ICU from sepsis which means galactin 3 is rises early on 
So you can say it's an early biomarker, but it's really an instigator because when we blocked it, we reversed the process. And my project with the NIH is specifically on development of a galactin-3 filter, which I already developed, where we are now in, that's called Exegal-3, that we are now very soon are going to start animal safety studies and then going to the clinic with the idea, can we attenuate sepsis and kidney damage from sepsis? 11 million people die from sepsis a year. It's the number one killer. So, of course, there's a great potential, and I hope it works. And uh, and this is, a, I've been working on it for a decade now. So Okay, so uh, I have a couple of questions. This is super fascinating. Um, <laughs> would you say that, uh, I'm just processing this and, and thinking out loud to understand this better for myself, and hopefully for anybody listening, um, that the reason galactin-3 is not very effective, the protein our body makes to basically be the carrier, the bus to take these inflammatory molecules to other parts of the area, to the body that are damaged, right? It's basically taking these molecules to help heal that area. Would you say that it's not, eff it's not very effective um, because we are so damaged so often that it's significantly overproduced and pr producing too much inflammation in the body because of stress, because of toxins, because of pesticides, because of the food, because of the toxins in the water, the air? Is it because of our modern lifestyle that it's not doing as great a job as it could if we were living like, you know, you were saying you're, you're out in a retreat in nature and eating very clean and drinking water and meditating and things like that. Uh, yeah, it's a great point. And there is a lot of truth to what you said, but in principle, the mechanisms the Electin-3 uses for repair, is that's a survival paradox, are inflammation and fibrosis. So the end result of the Galactin-3 being activated is actually damage. But this right. is the body's but, attempt. But, but you're it, right. Isn't there a healthy amount of inflammation yes. that our bodies absolutely. benefit from, right? Absolutely. If, if it's not chronic, if it's an acute situation absolutely. for short term. Yeah. Absolutely. So if we're able to downregulate and shut down the inflammatory process, if we recover and we don't create a chronic cascade of cytokines, the cytokine storm, we see it like the COVID long haul is an example. And uh, right now, it's so many people know then yes, it will come down, the levels will go down, and it will not have an ongoing effect. Because galactin-3 is very important in the first few minutes of response to an infection. And you, and you won't shut it down if you, if you, even if you remove it or if you block it, because it already did its job. It does its job within minutes. Ideally, if it could turn on for a few minutes and then turn off, will be in a great place. But we mm -hmm. see in our studies where we don't blow galactin-3, the levels of galactin-3 go up. The levels of interleukin-6 then start going up much more dramatically. Kidney damage starts happening. The animals die. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. Because galactin-3 is an upstream molecule, it starts the process. It will doesn't need a lot of increase to make a big difference. It will increase by less than by 50%. It will double itself. Okay? Extreme cases, it will triple itself. Interleukin-6 will go up 1,000-fold, 5,000-fold, wow. because it's downstream. So trying to catch the cytokines is like stopping a waterfall with a bucket. You got to shut it, but if you can shut it down at the top, so the shutting down, we blow galactin-3, and on a deeper level, what we talked with meditation, lifestyle, we change the driving forces of this process yeah. with the recognition that some of it are part of the package we came to this world with because of our genetics, our epigenetics, our multi-generational effects on our body, on our health, on our being, on the way we function. And so meditation addresses multi-generational health issues and offers multi-generational healing. That's the power of meditation, specifically when it comes from the heart. So you actually talk about that in your book. I remember reading your own 
story about that. I, if we have time, I want to get into that. Um, so I'm just making a note because I think that's really fascinating. Um, but before we do, I want to stay on this topic of uh, Galactin 3 and COVID. So you had said that the, um, the spike protein is actually similarly designed. It looks very similar to the Galactin 3 protein is that right almost almost identical almost identical and so that's that's it's really uh interesting to think about because galactin 3 starts the inflammatory cascade process uh, right Uh, as you said it's an upstream molecule that then all of these inflammatory molecules downstream uh, get released into the bloodstream and spread wherever it's needed in the body and uh, apparently the spike protein on you know from from the coronavirus does the same thing, right? Yeah, the spike protein is the survival protein of the corona that has to get somewhere attached and, and create a reaction. And the galactin-3 is our survival protein, and they both use similar mechanism. What do they use? They use inflammation, and what they cause? They cause chronic damage. So, for example, many patients with the, with the, with, with COVID, especially early on, you know, had acute kidney injury and 50% of them would die. And so it's fascinating. There was a very large study in uh, already in August of 2020, published in Mexico City, where a patient came to the ER with COVID, regardless of how sick they were at the time of admission, how big was the involvement of the lungs, the levels of galactin-3 at time of admission would determine who will get to the ICU later on mm. and who will die. Same same story, right? And interesting, I was really wanted to 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 study to try to test modified respect in in in, uh, in COVID, but you know there was there was really a strong grip with pharma, so I couldn't, you know, I'm just I'm, I wasn't so that, enough of so a player. That, that was my next question. Are there any studies that you're aware of with Modified citrus pectin blocking. There are one, some, there's one small study side. with the galactin 3 blocker showing that the for acute that it, it it the resolution is quicker. There's not enough studies. And but the role of blocking galactin 3 is more relevant to address the long term inflammatory response driven by the coronavirus, the, the, the COVID long haul. It's really similar to what other viruses do, but it's a little bit a little bit nastier. So it's really about realizing that there is the acute phase and there is a chronic phase. And the chronic phase, my experience in the clinic, it's almost universal. Even if you hardly had any symptoms, you will see a worsening of the oxidation of the lipids. You will see lipoprotein A going up. You will see cytokines going up. And it will take time until they normalize. And the quicker we normalize them, the better place we'll be in because while they are up, they are causing damage. They are causing damage to different end organs based on our weaknesses. If it's the heart or the kidneys or the brain, and people know it, these are the classical immune system, right? With severe allergies, etc. So yeah, it's really, I mean, COVID has changed medicine. We can't just, uh, there's a whole generation has to deal with the, uh, you know, post-COVID symptoms. Right. So you've been talking about modified citrus pectin as basically the, um, we call it, a, uh, I don't know if you call it a molecule or, uh, I mean, now it's a supplement. I mean, I, I take it. You guys sell, I know you have a company that sells it, Pectisol. Um, I love it uh, as a uh, as just a daily supplement. So it's a supplement, but modified citrus pectin. What is it? Uh, it's from citrus peels, right? But talk about the process, what it is, and and how it got discovered as this right. natural so galactin three blocker. Yeah. So the initial person who discovered the idea was Dr. Avram Raz from Wayne State, which I collaborate with. I published an important paper with like two years ago. And uh, I uh, so the, the the inner peel of the of the citrus fruit, the white part, has pectin. Pectin is a long chain of carbohydrate of galacturonic acid with a certain structure that is not absorbable. 
it's a fiber. It doesn't get absorbed. When we modify it to a very specific shape and a much smaller size, it will get absorbed into the bloodstream and will have its biological beneficial effects. So for example, all the papers on modified citrus pectin are on, on pectosol. There's about 80 published papers. And uh, so it's a very specific structure that is reproducible that allows it to get absorbed and then it has its immune regulation effect. It's also a very powerful chelator of heavy metals of toxins. We've published on it. And that's why I really feel it's an essential supplement for us uh, to take on an ongoing basis because galactin-3 drives aging. If you look at centurions, centurions, very interesting study, centurions have lower level galactin-3 than people in their 70s or 80s. And we look at the study, you can see within the 70s and 80s, the group of the low galactin-3, these are the ones who are going to make it to be a centurion. So there is a there is a correlation between the level of galactin three, like people in their fifties, a very large study, the Firmingham offspring study, eight thousand people. There is a correlation between galactin three levels and all cause mortality in the next ten years, where pe where the highest twenty percent of galactin three compared to the lowest twenty percent had three times more mortality from any causes three more three times more people died within 10 11 years do you know why their galactin three levels are so low is it their lifestyle their diet do you know Wait, low, so low some stress some of it is genetic they produce uh, less monomers less single galactin threes that can go to different places and cause damage so there is a genetic component re related to mie mielo to MMP, MMPs, and uh, and uh, part of it exactly is lifestyle, stress, trauma, scarring. We have to remember, galactin-3 drives scarring. So when we have a scar that is active, it will drive galactin-3 up on an ongoing basis, including a scar from surgery. What do you mean active? Like, what's an active scar? In some level, every scar is active. Now you will say, no way, Isaac, what are you talking about? And so in my book, you know, I talk about galactin-3, I explain the whole philosophy, metabolism, inflammation, the heart role, and then I talk about different diseases, biggest chapter is cancer, and then I talk about solution, detoxification, healing the scar of survival, and freeing the survival paradox. It's a meditation introduction, at least. So what do I mean? And so there is a therapy called neural therapy that Dr. Klingout was a driver in the United States, deserves the credit. It's a German method, and I love using it together with homeopathics. And you can inject a skull. And the skull can be 30, 40 years old. 100% of the people, after you inject it with an anesthetic, with procaine, which numbs the area practically for 45 minutes, the skull is going to get smaller by 10, 15%, some people 80%. But when it gets smaller, it will never come back. Mm. Never. And I, on this, I can say, I've done hundreds, probably thousands of this. And people will feel a difference in the, how they feel because the energy is flowing. Because the scar is a dead, a hardening of tissue, a dysfunctional tissue where it's not supposed to be. Why? It's holding the trauma, right? Just like you said about the neuropeptide. When we numb it, the brain doesn't get the input from the scar that there is a problem and it releases. So it's amazing. And it's like, for some people it's dramatic. If I do it a few times, scar practically almost disappear. After 20, 30, 40 years, doesn't matter how old they are. So I have uh, a scar. I have a scar. I mean, I don't think you can see it from that far. Uh, it's a, I got cut with a knife uh when i was a teenager so it was a long time ago so it was well over 20 20 plus years ago and the scar is still pretty can you, you see it up can close. you can you feel it when you when you touch yeah yeah I can yeah so yeah so this will be a good scar to actually inject so so you're saying if you have a scar like that that's visible then is that is that a constant 
chronic inflammatory process that's happening? Potentially, if we didn't heal well, yes. Potentially, yes. okay. And that's what we always address. So physical scars are obvious, but what about emotional scars? What about psychological scars? What about multi-generational scars? And we know the DNA gets scarred from traumas and a lot of work in the Holocaust. And in my book, right, I tell the story how I had this intense chest pain and upper back pain since I was like 10, 12 years old. And with some scoliosis I developed, and no matter what meditation and I perfect yoga, you know, all the crazy poses, and it was still there. And I'm named after my grandfather, Isaac, and uh, who who died at age 50 from stomach cancer. And my grandmother, who really saved the family from the Holocaust, uh, she died at 98. And on her graveyard, my mother turns to us and she says, you know, she was buried next to my grandfather and we're all there, all the five siblings. And she says, you know, your grandfather had, there were 12 uh, children and Hitler killed 10 of them. We never knew. We were wow. never told about it. They never spoke about it. And my grandfather had to stomach it, to hold it in his stomach, and he got stomach cancer. And uh, when I worked through meditation, through healing, through somatization and release, multiple systems on the trauma of holding the trauma of the Holocaust and, and really having an, a deep experience of uh, forgiveness and acceptance, uh, that is sensitive to talk about, especially for for Jewish or Israeli people. It's hard to even say such a thing. Uh, then uh, the pain just went away. Now I can push as hard as I can. I, I I I don't feel anything, and my chest opened up. This is like after having it for fifty years. But interesting, my mother, which I didn't tell her what happened to me. She's in her mid to late eighties. My mother could never watch any program on the Holocaust, was suddenly able to watch programs on the Holocaust and talk about it. And now share more memories. So what happened, my healing experience went back to my grandfather that I'm named after. So this is a backward healing. But because time goes backward and forward, the healing then affected my mother without me talking to her. And I've had, I didn't write about it in my book, but I had a lot of experiences, uh, you know, because of this, of, of this ability. Uh, my mother used to go come to all of my meditation retreats. Now she doesn't. She's an amazing woman, was a judge, almost made it to the Supreme Court. Remarkable woman, really amazing. So when I came to Israel, we would spend, you know, I come a lot and we would spend quality time. This was like five, six years ago, maybe even more, maybe seven years ago. We took a walk to the beach where my father used to take us always. And I sat and I meditated with her. And I was just opened, just opened. And she, she meditated next to me. And then suddenly she started crying, you know. And now I didn't think about anything. I was just, my heart was open. My mind was a little relaxed. After what happened, she says, for the first time, I went back to the age 17 when my father died. I never thought, I never felt it. It was totally buried. And I connected with the experience. So for me, I saw it as a great release, you know? And I didn't try to do it. She was just in my field because the electromagnetic field of the heart is bigger than our body. It affects not only every cell in our body, you know this so well, Nathan, I mean, Yep. That it affects people around it. It goes through Zoom, actually, right? And, now, it's, and, people... it's, and it's measurable. We have of devices course, that can, it's course. been spoken about for thousands of, of years in of the course. ancient scriptures, of but course. it's measurable today. So when somebody it's sits amazing. next to me and I can a little bit direct it, and then they just sit in this field. But so one thing is this, wow, first time, you know? And my mother talked about it with people and therapists and, you know, never came up. It's just mm. the moment that the holding, the protection, the survival, needing to survive as an only child with a tough mother, you know, that that was a survivalist, amazing. How this, she made the family survive. Suddenly she could let go. But then you want to talk about meditation, comes the second part. 
Meditation is not what we experience. It's our relationship with what we experience. So for me, when I hear this, wow, there is a letting go. For her, she started crying. She said, oh, it felt painful, you know? And it still did something, but she missed the opportunity of releasing because she is a survivor. So she held to the experience. And that's the secret in healing. That's the secret in healing, is a letting go, letting go. The reason why this pain went away is because when I connected to the pattern, I just let it go. If I would have analyzed it and tried to do something with it, yeah, it would be better for two days and it would come back, right? Because the neuropeptides will show up again. So it's another, you know, but so that's part of healing the scars of survival and that's a multi-generational. And I tell a lot of stories in the book, but it's remarkable for me, the power of the mind, you know, it's and, and including in my own health journey multiple times. It's just, it's really our state of mind is, and our in the state of our heart is really the key to healing. My my wish for my third act in life is to refine my meditation capacity and to really share it and demonstrate that with the mind and the heart, anything and everything is possible. Mm. I love it. Hey, I just want to pause a second and ask you, are you enjoying this episode so far? Are you getting good value from this content? If so, then I know you're going to absolutely love Healing Life. At healinglife.net, you get exclusive and premier access to hundreds of the top world's doctors, experts, cancer conquerors and survivors, exclusive interviews that I have done with all these experts and doctors uh, that are not available for free online. They're only available at healinglife.net. So not only do you get access to all of those, but you actually get to speak with these doctors and experts and ask them any question you want about health and healing. And this is available exclusively to Healing life members you can try it out for free go to healinglife.net and you can start your free trial there and uh, whether you're interested in learning more about detox or cancer diet and nutrition and nutritional science about diabetes about heart disease autoimmune disease anti-aging longevity all of these topics are covered in depth and more are continuing to be added at healing life and again you get to talk to these doctors yourself so i invite you to set up a free trial at healinglife.net and I hope to see you over there. Now, let's get back to the show. So, let's talk about forgiveness for a little bit. You know, it's been said that you know, wishing wishing ill on somebody or holding regrets or holding um, you know, negative thoughts towards somebody, whether it's whether it's anger or even sadness, right? Where we think of somebody and, and you know, it, it tenses us up or, you know, oh, I can't stand that person or I hate that person or that person did this terrible thing to me or this group of people did this terrible thing to my family. They're the worst people, right? Whatever those negative thoughts are, it's been said, and I love this analogy, it's super simple, is, you know, wishing or feeling that way towards anybody else is like um, having a poison apple and instead of you giving it to them, you're eating it yourself. Right. Okay. You are you are literally killing yourself from the inside out. And as you said, something like having your family go through the terror of the Holocaust and, and having those memories, having that generational trauma, you know, having the memories from whether it's grandparents or great grandparents and passed down, you know, or any other kind of, you know, terrible socially destructive, uh, terrifying, traumatic experiences happen to many different groups, right? Whether it's, whether it's black people, it is uh, Asians, it's Hispanics, uh, even white people. There are so many different yeah. traumas that have happened right. to so many different groups of people, right. right? For generations, for thousands of years. And so whatever any one of us might be holding on to, uh, we are literally killing ourselves from the inside out. And as you said, it's a very difficult thing to, to talk about in some of these regards um, with some of these, you know, terrible situations. Forgiveness. So how did you come to, and I can speak from my own experience that, that forgiving uh, has been a huge part of my own healing 
and I've talked about this many, many times. I won't get into some of the forgiveness I've had to do in my own life, but forgiving others and forgiving myself has been essential to my own healing and my own, you know, inner awakening, my own inner peace and happiness. It's been essential, uh, absolutely. But how did you find forgiveness for something so terrible that happened to your family? And how can other people maybe, you know, follow in your footsteps? Wow. It was amazing. It was profound. And I'm uh, concerned about sharing it in public because it's too hard to to really digest. Uh, I would just, uh, because for people say, how how can you even talk like this? You know, I think it will really offend some, some many, you know, Jewish people will actually not be, don't, won't comprehend that it's possible. And it's, but there is something, we, we cause harm out of inner suffering. When people are happy, when they love, they don't hurt other people. We hurt other people when we are in a state of suffering. So I was able through this meditation to connect with the suffering of those people who caused the harm. Two great details that I've never read actually, to great accuracy. That was, was amazing, you know? There were details I found in my dish that were totally true that I never read about. And so when I recognize the pain that this terrible Hey, people, you know, the pain they had inside which caused them to function in such a distorted way, then the forgiveness was to their pain. Mm. You know, it wasn't to what they've done. It was to their pain that we all are in the same boat. We all, and then there was this huge release and then it just transformed into love. Right, you're not forgiving their actions. You're exactly. forgiving. You're forgiving the things that that happened to them, that were inside of them, their own traumas, their own healing, the things exactly. that led them to do right. the things that they right. did. You're forgiving that, and you're not forgiving right. the the terrible actions. Of course, of did. course, and and you're not justifying it. And so, and sometimes we can do it. Sometimes we cannot. I know this was after I did a retreat for a few weeks, and I was teaching a lot, and I was in the right space, and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, uh, and it was a process, but this is really what open heart medicine is. And this is, and you said something really important about the apples. I want to go a little bit and expand with your permission. Yeah. So people think, you know, if I take on other people's negative energies, I'm going to get sick. But guess what? We are taking other people's negative energies, even if we don't know. When you're upset at somebody, you're upset for something they've done. You are upset. You are taking on and you're actually damaging yourself. You're just not aware of it. So every cell in our body, as you talked about the membranes and the boundaries of the cell, the mitochondria, wants to take in nourishment and wants and releases poison, toxins, what it doesn't want. That's what we do in the skin. You know, what we do in our gut. We absorb what we want and we release what we don't want that goes out through the stools. So... Every cell in our body wants to survive. And as part of it, it wants to take nourishment and it puts out what it doesn't want. We do it in the membrane through receptors, through channels that decide what comes in and releases what we don't want. And we have a dialogue with our environment that accepts what we don't want, collected through the lymph system, through the venous system. And there is a dialogue between nourishment and letting go of what we don't want. And... When we go into a place of survival, of course, it gets disrupted. And interesting, I was just, uh, Nathan, just read a very interesting study where they can put a stent in the kidney for patients who cannot, who has high blood pressure because of, of kidney issues and don't respond to medication. And they numb, they damage the nerve sympathetic signal that goes to the brain and the blood pressure goes down. I mean, it will be easier to meditate, actually. It's like the, the exact <laughs> and same. And a lot less painful <laughs> and, exactly. and a lot less expensive. <laughs> exactly. But that's sympathetic system. Wow. Yeah. The world is waking up and you just made a procedure out of it. So, well, that, right. that's the thing about, that's the thing I'm surprised about uh, with modified citrus pectin, that it is a supplement and not right. a drug. Right. And you've been a part of helping keep it a supplement, right? Yeah, I was insistent on keeping. Believe me, I was I was insistent on it being a supplement, so it won't be manipulated and won't cost like you know five thousand dollars. Only people with good insurance can get it. 
definitely. Well, and some, uh, of, the chemo, some so, of the chemo drugs today are so expensive, right? So we're talking about cancer, for example. I mean, in drugs and for all kinds of ailments. Especially in oncology. Medicine is bankrupt because of the cost of drugs. And some of them are very helpful. Some of them are questionable. A few weeks of life with a lot of side effects, you know, and then right. misery. But it's, it's part of what you call standard of care, a terrible term. Because who wants to be standard, right? Standard is mediocre. Mm -hmm. Standard per definition is mediocre. It's in the middle, you know. We want to be on the creative, innovative part. But going back to the body, so and that's really important to understand why we are built and why open heart medicine is so powerful. So every cell, we talked about nourishment and, 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 uh, and detoxification. The only organ that is different in the body is the heart. The heart actually accepts all the dirty blood from every single cell in the body without discrimination. It doesn't say I'm going to take it just from the kidney, just from the liver, from everywhere. In fact, it has to get it. If it doesn't get dirty blood into the right atrium and right uh, and, 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 no, and then right uh, and right chamber, it won't have enough pressure to give clean blood to the body. So the heart accepts everything we don't want. And it accepts it from our past, right? Because the blood coming to the heart left the cells before it came to the to the heart. That's important. So everything we don't want, which is stuff that we didn't want in the last 10 minutes, and is multi-generational trauma that was released from a cell, and the trauma happened 1,500 years ago. It's still in our body. You and I know it. Science knows it. It's coming to the heart. Our personal drama now connects to the universe through the breathing. Amazing. You know, a molecule of air in our mouth is connected to the whole universe and to the all aspects of time. It's hard to comprehend, you know? And then for the universe, for the environment, our drama is not so big. It contains it. It accepts it with open arms, with endless space, with infinite healing power. And that's why it's important to keep our environment. Not only are we inflamed, our environment gets now inflamed, global warming, right? It's an expression. So then we breathe in clean air, we have the exchange on the lungs and the heart gets clean blood. And what does the heart do? It gives clean blood without discrimination. So the heart gives clean blood without discrimination, meaning the aorta is a stiff artery. Now, the heart, first thing the heart does, and again, it's an egg or, it, or, or, or a chicken. First thing the heart does, it, it gives blood. Then when it relaxes, some of the blood from the aorta comes back towards the heart, aortic uh, valve. The coronary arteries relax and the heart nourishes itself. So the heart doesn't nourish itself until it finishes its giving. The heart is the most selfless organ, but that's part of its survival. If the heart doesn't give, if it doesn't relax, if it doesn't take all the difficulties and use them as wood to the fire, to generate nourishment and love and compassion, we won't be alive. And this is why meditations that connect with the heart, and the key one is Tong Len, taking suffering and giving love and compassion, have such powerful healing power. And these are the kind of meditation that you learn in the morning, you know in the afternoon, and you can show somebody three days later. Why? Because we are built to do this. We are built for the heart to flow. And it's so beautiful that, you know, when I when I connected it with an insight to this analogy, I said, oh my God, how come nobody's talking about it? It's who we are, you know? It's the, the fact that the heart is the only organ that nourishes itself after it does its work. You know, technically, the heart could have had the, the, the coronary arteries up in the left atrium when there's a clean blood coming in, the atrium relaxes, the heart gets get nourished. No, no, no. It finishes its work. And when it relaxes, it can nourish itself. But if it can't, doesn't nourish itself, it can't give. So the heart gives, takes care of itself in order to take care of others and as part of taking care of others. And that's really important. Opposite to a narcissistic point of view where we take care just of ourselves out of a survival 
uh, trauma-based uh, functioning. So when we realized it, now suddenly everything you talked about, the EPO, we just burn it in the flow of the heart. And because it's physiologically happening anyway, Nathan, it's easier to tune into it from a meditation compared to the mind, which does exactly the opposite. The mind stops and analyzes and analyzes and debates. and does. So to allow the mind to relax, that's a big job because we're not <laughs> used to do this, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? But the heart is just connecting with who we are. So mindfulness have served well in slowing us down, in creating space. But now it's time to transition from mindfulness, which is the basis, into heartfulness. That's really my, one of the senses I love, I love to say, we need to move from mindfulness into heartfulness because that's where the healing happens. That's yeah. where the miracle happens. Yeah, you're probably familiar with the Heart Math Institute. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, amazing they, work. Yeah, they've yeah. done amazing work for years, scientific research on a lot of what you're talking yeah. about. I actually have re- I have some references from them in my book. Nice. Yeah, and I've you know I've I've uh, uh, interviewed um, uh, people from their team yeah. for years, learning about and yeah. using their HRV meditation right. device and experiencing all that. And it's really cool to see that through meditation you can increase your hrv your heart rate variability which is becoming more popularized today yeah right people are understanding that a higher hrv which is basically not higher heart rate it's heart rate variability it's that variation between beats the higher that is right more associated it is with a healing response in the body exactly and so you can we have a lot of possibilities we are not locked into one pattern when we are rigid, we will have a little bit of variability in what we eat, in how we think, in what we believe. When we are more flexible, we have greater heart rate variability. Our mind is more flexible. Our being is more flexible. Our blood vessels are more flexible. Our immune response is more flexible, etc. It's all microcosmos, macrocosmos. It's all interrelated. So for people who are new to meditation or want to, implement a meditation practice or maybe people are meditators and they want to try something different or new where's a good place you recommend for people to start well that's a good question uh i think that uh, using a simple technique that just allows you to slow down and to create space in your being by using the breath these are very good simple techniques to start with I really hope uh, in the second part of 2023 to start teaching more in the United States. I, for for certain reason, it kind of happened that I focused on Israel, where I went twice a year for a decade and have thousands of students. But now I feel like it's time for me to really share it here. So I hope in the second half of 23 to offer a, a Zoom retreat for a few days or maybe a series of uh, where I can really lead people through through a process. Uh, it's remarkable what can happen when we when we do these retreats, even f- three, four days, five days, a week is like, wow, where there's a certain diet that allows the letting go and Qigong and yoga and breathing and, and I teach and guide people and I bring the science into it and we meditate a lot and there is a group healing it's remarkable what happens to people, especially with traumas, with fibromyalgia, with chronic pain, but also with cancer. Objectively, cancer markers go down between the beginning of the retreat and the end of the retreat. So um, I'd be really interested in, you know, I've been host, I've been producing and hosting events, yeah. retreats, conferences, yeah. festivals for years. And yeah. uh, I'd love to talk with you more about, uh, yeah. you know, maybe co-producing a retreat yeah. like that. I've, I've had dreams of doing a new one like that uh it's time for me it's time for me and i think maybe one of the reasons why we connected so deeply it's really time for me to do it because you know on one level i kind of share a part of me says okay just you've done so much just go relax meditate (laughs) you know i love hawaii swim which is great you know yeah but my uh, my first buddhist spiritual teacher he he wrote a he wrote a letter to somebody 
towards the end of his life and somebody helped him. And he said, you know, I've been introduced to the nature of my mind at the age four in a vision. And since then, my mind opened up and opened up and I got trained for so many years. Now in my 70s, I feel a responsibility to share what I know. You know, he would be, and he wasn't very healthy. He would, he would uh, fly, let's say, from Asia to, to Brazil through United States and he would have four or five hours in the airport. He would say, try to get a group where I can help or I can meet with people who need my help, you know. So it was this, no, he was, he, he's, he was a true master. But the idea is that when you gain a lot of skills, and you refine them, then there is a responsibility to share them. I really yeah. feel so. And yeah. so hopefully, you know, and I think there is this connection with meditation and healing is unique. And it's interesting for me, uh, Nathan, that I discovered it on, on the spiritual meditation uh, journey of letting go of the survival and opening our heart. And then I, in my research, it's the same thing that happened to me with, with Galactin 3. You know, which really does the same. I dissolving what causes isolation and separation uh, through blocking or through therapeutic aphoresis, which is the process I specialize in. So you just reminded me of um, this Buddhist master I used to train under in Escondido, California, uh, years ago, and and he was a really famous monk in Thailand who actually got like excommunicated from Thailand. The king didn't like him being there because he had so much power, he had more power than the king. When he would go out to the street and and teach and show up, like there were literally hundreds of thousands of people that would show up to listen to this. Uh, I've seen pictures of him, you know, standing on a giant stage teaching meditation and Buddhism and and literally like 100,000 people as far as I can see. And so, you know, he came to the US and started meditation retreat centers and, um, and one of them, I lived really close by, and I just, I didn't even know anything about him. I was just, a friend was, uh, a spiritual mentor was like, hey, let's go to this, uh, uh, you know, place and go meditate. I was like, great. And then one day this master monk shows up and I meet him and we really connected. We really bonded at a deep level. And, and um, one day he wrote this, he wrote it in Thai, and then he wrote it also in English. I actually have it on a framed, just a piece of paper, I framed it as a reminder, his name was Praajan Yantra Amaro. And he wrote on this piece of paper, he says, the more you give, the more you get. The more you share, the more you grow. The more you let go, the more you're free. Freedom is power. And it just, I just reminded of that because of what you were saying is you're, you're entering in a stage uh, where you just feel this desire to share, right? To give, to share, to teach. Um, and, and I love that saying from him. It's like, look, the more we share, the more we grow. And, and, and at the same, what I also love is the, the, the paradox of um, not only uh, of giving and getting and, you know, giving and receiving, but also letting go, which is an essential spiritual teaching, right? Letting go of expectations, letting go of judgment, letting go. And you just talked about that, you know. Uh, yeah, and it's really what the heart does. You think about it, the heart gives. The moment we stop giving, the heart's survival and is to give. The moment the heart stops giving, we are dead. So the heart gives, and then what it does, it relaxes, it lets go of the contraction. And when it relaxes of the contraction, you get, you get, uh, when it relaxes of the contraction, you get nourishment. But something very beautiful he said, he got into power through giving. It's love that led him to power. It's a different quality of power. Yeah. It's power that comes from love. Right. That's a great power. There are people who have energetic power and don't develop the giving. And then you get power without love. These are dangerous people. Mm. You know, through history, right? These are like abusers. You it's saw you world. saw a number of these people during COVID, you know, all over the news and all over the place yeah. Uh, yeah. where yeah. you could sense that yeah. 
they really didn't care about the well-being of, yeah. of people and humanity. Yeah. It was all about, you know, more power, more power for me, right? Yeah. That was my sense anyway. And you see it in Geneva. So that's beautiful that he got his power was an expression of the giving. That's, that's, that's really, that's the infinite healing power of the heart. It's really the infinite healing power of the heart. So I, I, I studied with a, a master Qigong teacher in Santa Fe as well um, for a few years, Master Ming Tong Gu. And so you were talking about Qigong and studying yeah. Qigong and practicing that. I love Qigong. I actually do a practice every morning. I stand on a, the, do you know the power plate? Uh, like vibrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have it so I actually stand. I love. I love like um, doing multiple things at the same time. So I actually stand on that uh, while I'm doing, you know, some qigong, some chanting, some visualization, affirmations, uh, energy practice, and EFT tapping, and then setting my mind for the day and sending healing energy to you know family and friends mm -hmm. and colleagues and to the whole planet. And, and, and sitting in a squat as well. And so I do this every morning to start my day, where it's a combination of, of all of those things. Um, and I do it for a short time, five, six minutes in the morning, but it's, it's a combination of, of all of that. And I find starting my day that way is very powerful. Before that, when I wake up, I start with a gratitude practice, just you know, meditation, gratitude practice. I start that at night. I do that at night before bed as well. Um, and sometimes I will sit, you know, for a 15, 20, 30 minute meditation. I don't do it as much each day now as I used to. And I probably need to start doing like just a dedicated 30 minutes a day now, uh, every day as I used to do like 30 minutes to an hour every day. But I like, like you were talking about, I've implemented it into, into my day in short, like, um, short intervals all day long right where like in the morning and as yeah. i wake up and at night and multiple times before interviews and meetings and so i'm doing short meditations all throughout the day uh which i love but how important it is is it for somebody to have like just a dedicated 30 minute meditation practice a day and is 30 minutes uh, enough do we need more do we need less no, i uh, i actually studied with ming tong many years ago when you just oh stopped. you did oh yeah. you know ming tong okay yeah, I know him well. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, studied a, with him, I think as so early funny. as 2008, 2009. So very er, early on. And yeah, I'm, so, awesome. and so, yes. So, you know, from his approach, you can never meditate too much. You know, yeah. there's no, there's no such a danger, <laughs> but I think it has to be suitable for the person. So if somebody is, is very high energy and it's hard for them to sit, then you do short meditation multiple times. It's especially important to do meditation when you start your day. And I really like the fact that, you, that I mean, you have a really good teacher. And it's the end of the day. So the end of the day is a time when we review our daily activity. And it's a time when we rejoice for anything that we have done that helps somebody else. And then is a thing we've done that benefited, you know, us and made us a better person. And we let go of anything negative that we have done. Very important. It's not feeling guilty. It's letting go. So we don't feel guilty later on. And you we, and people can do it also by visualizing white light coming through the top of their head yeah. and washing their body until the body becomes lighter, like a body of white light. And then this is a very basic practice. There are more esoteric practices built on this. And then when we feel this lightness, then we go to sleep. And it will affect the quality of our sleep, the insight during our sleep, and it will turn sleep into a meditation practice. And then when we wake up, we can take three deep exhalation, kind of releasing. And then we just let our gaze just rest in the space in front of us, completely open. And then if people are less trained and they get carried by thought, then just follow your breath and just emphasize the exhalation and the letting go until you feel like, like your spider wave that gets cut and your visual, your experiential field grows, get bigger and bigger. And now if you feel that you're more relaxed, you feel more happy, don't stop there. Stay there. If it's another minute, if it's another two, if it's another five, and let it percolate. And then using it for healing, we often, when we meditate, we meditate it from here out, which is very, very typical. 
then let it come into your being. First, let it come into your being by letting the, the experience of openness, of spaciousness come into your heart, into your body. Then you will dissolve the boundary between the outside and the inside. One of the first things that happens when meditation truly unfolds is that the sense of boundary of skin falls away. You don't, you don't no longer feel the separation between the outside and your body. You, and then you flip it, and now you come from the inner center of your heart, from the center of your spine and the level of your heart. And from there, everything comes. To a place where now the openness, like when you're sending healing to every person, now the healing is going through every cell in your body. And when it goes through every cell in your body, and it goes outside, you realize that when it's healing the cells in your body, these cells were made out of countless human beings. Countless. If each generation is 25 years, in 2,000 years back, it's an infinite number of people. Two times, two times, two times, two, you know, it's an infinite number. They all affected us. They all made us who we are. They all gave us our strengths in one level or another. And they all also left some difficult imprints. So when we are sending this light through every cell in our body, we are also healing these people because they have deposited their traumas in us. And if we are healing a trauma of somebody from a thousand years ago, there are there are two to the I don't remember the you know there are probably hundreds of thousands of people who are holding this trauma just like with all the genetic testing. Now we are affecting all of them. Wow, and we just sit in this field, recognizing the interdependence. You know, in Buddhism they say you should have love and compassion for others as if they were your parents, mm. or sometime. Yeah. Well, mathematically, we are all interrelated. It's I, impossible I mean, that, that we are not. That's assuming that you that you love your parents and you have a yeah. good relationship. Right, with right. Your of course, of course. So that's so that's, so that's a great comment, especially in the West. Yeah. So I would say it can be your children, wherever you feel, right? Yeah. But at some point, all of us were parents or relatives of somebody else. At some point, going back thousands of years. It's mathematically impossible. People who come from sim similar ethnic background, religious background, we've probably had millions of, of, of joint relatives going back. So this crazy interdependence, this complexity, remember we talked about complexity and simplicity today? This complexity, these pieces of wood, these multiple expressions, they all dissolve in the field of love. They all dissolve in the field of light. So with this explanation, suddenly the meditation has more power because we have this understanding. And then once we have this understanding, then we just let go, even for a few seconds. And then during the day, we just remind ourselves, one of the things that saved me with my meditation and allowed me to, to progress beyond the fact that my teachers believed in me, I, I was kind of stuck, but I kept going, is that my my obsessiveness, I would remind myself every 10 seconds to meditate, literally. Later I was working, no matter what, every 10 seconds, rest your mind, relax, let go, let go, let go, all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long. So after, now, the few hours in the morning would charge me up. And then, and then it would kind of unwind, and I would remind myself until the next day, until it becomes a habit. So now it's a habit of mine to meditate when I talk, to meditate when I when I speak, and then what happens suddenly, everything you do in life becomes meditation. Everything you do in life becomes offering of healing at one level of another, depending on how tuned or untuned I am. You know, that's why it's a journey, right? But that's a, that's a, that's a great journey. So you said somebody's trauma a thousand years ago could be your trauma today. You could be holding can that affect trauma. you in your cell. Can be as a reason for your reactivity. How? Something happens. How does that? How does that happen? Because it gets certain genes, general certain scarring in your DNA, and then these genes that let's say respond with us with getting very angry at something. Okay, out of the blue, and. Uh, Sometimes we'll tell ourselves, wow, wow, did I get angry? This is so silly, right? But then it happens again and again. And then 
when we allow this healing to happen, then the tendency starts shifting. So first we do it deliberately, effortfully, and slowly, as you also mentioned during this interview, as we really release, that's like you talked about the crying, when we really release, and when the release comes up, we don't hold to the release, we let go of the release also, then we really, then the scar of the trauma goes away. Same scar, this is a psychological, emotional, and we know it, we know it with, with Holocaust survivors, you know, the, we know it with experiments on animals, right, where you put a, a, a certain worm, worm uh, uh, you put them in stress and you put fluorescent marker and it lights up and 13 generations later it will still light up because it was passed epigenetically so this is really there's a beautiful saying in Hebrew in Judaism which means everything is predetermined they're genetic and we have a choice that's epigenetic Yep. So what you and I are interested in is in shifting the epigenetic, the expression. It's very hard to change the genes, you know, but it's much easier to change the expression of the genes. Right. Every it time feels... our mind functions different, we eat differently, we feel differently, something that triggers this change of us shifts. And if we do it enough, we create a permanent shift. That's, for example, in cancer, the ability to re-differentiate a cancer cell so you get a less aggressive cancer over time, right? Not easy to do, but you see it, you know, mm -hmm. where suddenly a patient PSA doubling time goes, becomes slower because the cancer became less aggressive. The cell became less in a survival mode. Yeah, and we can, you know, epi, for those who don't know, epigenetics, epi means above or beyond. So above or beyond your genes, above or beyond your genetics, which gets, that's the part that we control. Like you said, we can control the expression of those genes, especially by the environment in which right. they live inside of our bodies energetically and biologically with the blood chemistry, right? So that's the part we have control over, which is exciting. Um, right. And we can change the genetic and epigenetic destiny of our children like my children how i how i live and how i treat them and how i guide them and teach them all of these things we're talking about and lead by right. example can literally affect you know as uh, native americans who i've studied a lot of time with over the years as well talk about the next seven generations right when exactly. you're thinking and taking action thinking about how does this affect you know, how does this pipeline, how does this planting this tree, how does starting this business, how does, you know, uh, putting this building over here, how does this affect the next seven generations, which in our current society, we're so short sighted, right? And with corporations, for example, it's only looking at the next three months, the next quarter, like that's right. it, you know, we've got to maximize profits for the next quarter. We're so, so short sighted okay. as a society today. But if we take a step back and go, hey, how does this affect not just the next year or seven years, but how does this affect my great, 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 great grandchildren, seven generations mm -hmm. from now? What a what a vastly different mindset that we take action from. And I, I certainly don't think that way all the time, but I'm but, it, of but it now. regardless if you think or not, that's what's happening. Time is affected forward and time is affected backward. And that's why the story I told about with my grandfather and my mother was the time went backward and then it went forward. Yeah. But I just did what I did right now, you know? And that's it, right? That's that's how we yeah. change our exactly. destiny and the destiny of our children and Completely. seven generations is Completely. what we do right now, this moment, every day. Yeah. And the big takeaway from this podcast, I would say, is commit to a meditation practice. If nothing else, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Anything, 10 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, in the five morning, minutes, in the yeah. evening, you yeah. know, but commit yeah. five minutes commit, a day, twice a day. Commit to enough that you feel different between the time you started to the time you ended. It doesn't mean that you feel better because sometimes in meditation, things will release themselves and it won't be as pleasant. It's fine. Everything is impermanent. Things come and go. It's just that you did something and you you came out of it different than when you came in, because yeah. then you created a change. And that's yeah. And I think maybe one more thing, 
if we have a great meditation as part of gratitude, it's always good to dedicate any benefits you have, you dedicate for any beings that needs it. Otherwise, we hold it in, it becomes, oh, I'm so good, lucky me, I did it. And, <laughs> yeah. and we, lose, we lose the power of sharing. And when we dedicate the merit, the benefit we got, it's always, I like to, to have the image of like a universal bank, of, uh, which is always available to us. Yeah. You can always connect with it because we are all interdependent. There's a relationship between us if we like it or not, you know. It's, well, and you, well, and you know, if you studied with Ming Tong, so you know the word how la, yeah, the, yeah. Chi the Chinese word yeah, meaning yeah. all all is well and yeah. getting better. And yeah. so in the in my meditation practice every morning when I do the Qigong and, yeah. and I chant how la, yeah. and I'm visualizing and sending energy to uh, all people around the world and wishing everybody, you know, health and happiness right. and abundance. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that feeling alone, that, I mean, that, that wishing, getting your play, getting yourself and this, I don't know how long it took me, probably years, but getting myself to get out of myself and to focus on helping and healing others. It is so, it's so self nourished. You don't do it for self nourishment, but it ends up becoming self nourishing and, and, so important. and very fulfilling, right? So important. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you said. And, yeah. and you know what I love talking with you, uh, many reasons I love talking with you, but one of the reasons I, I've loved this conversation is because you have such a profound and deep personal experience with the divine, with meditation, with esoteric experience and knowledge. And you can speak on that for days uh, at a deep personal level of knowing that you can tell that you know it personally and you have a conventionally trained medical background and and you're a science you're a published scientist and so you know you can you can kind of switch between it's a crazy, the two it's a great, talk about it's a crazy combination <laughs> it's Lucky a crazy combination not. yeah this is what we this is the it's future of medicine right? yeah this is what i see the future of medicine right here the future uh, of doctors sure. who are yeah. much more yeah. you know that's why yeah, it's I'm happening saying, i i think it's it's happening it's like i mean obviously you know if the swing goes down it comes up Unless we overstretch the rubber band and then it gets cut, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we didn't, right? <laughs> well, that's why I think holistic medicine is is you know holistic or integrative at the very right. least is the the future yeah. of, of healthcare. Yeah, people uh, who do holistic medicine, they like doing it. They enjoy doing it. You know, they they love doing it. Every patient is amazing. You know, the people who do regular medicine, it's it's tough. It's hard. They are being grinded down. You know, it's a tough. Just, Situation. So um, I'm going to give a few links for people to check out your your stuff. Uh, the Survival Paradox. Um, I know your website is drelias.com. Is that right? Yes. And they can uh, also get it. It's also available on Amazon. This is on Amazon. Yeah, that's yeah, where I got also, it. Yeah. Uh, Survival Paradox. Great book. Uh, it goes into even a lot more depth of what we could cover here on the podcast. So so go check it out. Get a copy. Um, also Pectisol. So we actually, I take this personally, uh, and I, uh, and I love it. And in fact, I need to take some right now. Um, <laughs> and, and I highly recommend it. And we, uh, promote it as a partner for you guys because I like it so much. And so, you know, we give a discount through our link. Everyone can take a look at it if you want it. This is the modified citrus pectin that we were talking about all the scientific studies about that blocked the galactin three. Um, panaceapectisol.com that's our domain that links to uh, your website panaceapectisol.com we'll put a link below there's a discount there for everybody um the thing with this is for someone like myself who is more about um well a couple of things so i train as a as an athlete goals of being a professional athlete so i'm doing significant damage to my body every day I train two hours in the morning, heavy weights, heavy lifting, two hours in the evening, heavy weights, heavy lifting, uh, gymnastics, running, cycling. I'm constantly tearing my body down. And I know that I'm very aware of it. So I do many, many things to, you know, improve recovery and so forth. So somebody like me as a, as an athlete who is constantly damaging my body, 
I think it's pretty similar to somebody who is living a, a standard American lifestyle who is constantly damaging their body, right? With, with food and toxins and so forth. Um, I don't know if it's the same or not. I don't know if that's a great. I question. love the fact that you recognize that that extreme sports is damaging the body. Oh, Some absolutely. People, yeah. I mean, I, I became a. <laughs> they argue. Yeah. That, that, I, had, I, uh, I have a whole discussion about it in the book. It's, I mean, if you don't recognize it, you're, you're blind because <laughs> right. I mean, we're constantly damaging our body. Now you go to the gym, you work out for an hour, you know, you're going to get great health benefits from that. But if you go right. to the gym and you're, you know, you're training two hours, three hours at a time, two or three times a day, you are constantly, you're, you're fighting this battle of, of damage, repair, damage, repair, damage, repair. So you have to do like I do everything that, that, uh, you know, I would have a cancer patient do, for example, um, sauna and ice bath and eight hours of sleep every night and lots of supplements you know which is one of the reason i take in pectisol um you know super super clean diet super so it's I, i'm a i'm aware of one i want to live as long and healthy as i possibly can but i also have a short term span in my life of where i could be a high highly uh competitive professional athlete in a sport that i absolutely love and it gives me drive every single day right so it's this fine balance for me of yeah. like oh, you know cool. it's perfect yeah, yeah knowing that it may take a few years off of my longevity but i think that maybe not, i can ma not, make up not, for not, it as well i don't think necessarily because you love it so I yeah, think. and I love it. It's I look forward to it every single day. It's not a That's it's amazing. not a chore. Now, now there are times it's like God, I'm so tired, I'm so beat up, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sore, blah blah, blah. and it's like yeah. I don't want to go. And then, but I always just get there. I get to the gym, whether it's at home or at the actual gym. And once I'm there, doing it, it's uh, I get all new life again. It's like I just you know took a huge you know two or three shots of uh, cat you know. Um, uh, espresso and I, you know, and I'm just feeling great. And it, all it does is takes me 15 minutes to get into it. Right. Um, so I know that. And so, yeah, the, I think the love for it is essential. Oh, Anything yeah. you do, right. Is, is do something yeah. you love. Um, oh, so anyway, so that was really a long way to ask you the question, like, what is a, um, what's kind of like a maintenance amount or let, you know, versus like a, like a maintaining health amount versus like a therapeutic amount of, of great pectisol, great of question pectisol. so the therapeutic amount, amount the, do, the optimal dose for people who have chronic health issues uh, is 15 grams a day that's what we do in the study so it's five grams three times a day it's like one scoop if you use powder one and a half scoop twice a day it's actually 18 capsules a day it's a lot and for for, for maintenance for healthier people with you know, with no significant health issues, it's only, only five grams a day, so six capsules. So one, so yeah, so basically the serving I just took was yeah. six capsules, so that right. that'd be once a day. But right. for me, because of how right. how much I'm tearing down my body, right. I should take more of the maximum. Yeah, and yeah, especially after a very large exercise, you know. Afterwards is better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, for you, you need you need to space it because you're doing it all the time. But yep. uh, for me, I take a lot in the morning just because it's it's convenient, like. I just fill the hand, whatever, 9, 10, 12, whatever there is, I throw Whatever in. fits. <laughs> and then in the evening, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I'd love to, I know we're, we're, we've are we got to wrap up now. Um, I'd love to do another podcast with you just on, you know, your thoughts on diet and, and other lifestyle, yeah. Yeah. you know, especially with cancer and other chronic diseases. Right. But this was... Uh, I have to say, um, Isaac, thank you so much for, thank you for, having for me. taking the time. Yeah for being here for for all the amazing work you do um this was fascinating i didn't know we were going to talk about meditation for like two hours and we did and i and i loved every second of it so um yeah just thank you so much thank you thank you wow yeah thank you for sharing your, your journey with everybody beautiful all right so uh for those of you tuning in go grab a copy the survival paradox um panaceapectisol.com if you want to check this out for yourself and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Nathan Crane podcast. If you found value in today's podcast, 
please share it with others. Subscribe to catch future episodes and leave a rating and a review. For more information or to connect with Nathan, check him out online at www.nathancrane.com and follow him on Facebook and YouTube at Nathan Crane. Until next time, this has been the Nathan Crane Podcast.